Welcome to Just Want a Quilt, a research podcast coming out of Tulane University Law School, where we explore all kinds of things, stories about quilting, tools, field trips, maybe some famous quilters stop by, and of course, a little bit of copyright thrown in just for fun. This is Elizabeth Townsend Gard. I'm a law professor at Tulane University Law School, and I just want to quit. So today we talk to Missy Ann Merrill. She is a scientist who quilts. She's so cool. We have a. Uh, she also does. She merges patterns, um, and then we talk about sort of if you can do that and what that means. Um, she also her dad taught her to sew, and she talks about um, having a. Um, a boy child, a son, um, and he, he talks about sort of quilting and sort of the gender issues in quilting. So it's pretty cool. Um, check it out. So I'm Misty Ann Merrill, and I'm calling from just outside of Boston in Massachusetts. Awesome. Um, that's cool. Uh, do you ever get up to the New England Quilt Museum up in Lowell? Yeah, I've actually been there several times. Uh, I managed to drag my mom once with me, and um, she had a really good time. And then I've gone and just sat there with a sketch pad. I'm actually a terrible drawer, Uh but I sketch out and try to learn, you know, their blocks and understand the geometry and why they made the choices. Yeah, I love that place. It's really great. Um, Okay, and then tell me your first memory of someone sewing or quilting in your life. So my very first memories are are my mom. Um, I remember scratchy Easter dresses. She really? was a garment sewer. Yeah. <laughs> All the scratchy lace that they put oh, on Italian right. dresses. And uh, then my mom entered the workforce when I was about five years old. And I stayed at home with my dad, myself oh. and my siblings. And my dad um, used a sewing machine because it was a tool. So when I decided I wanted a costume, he was like, well, this is the tool you use. So let's go learn how to use that tool. So it was a very different approach, it, yeah. even though he's actually quite artistic. Um, I don't think he approached it in that way. And that's probably how I learned not to fear machines. That's really cool. All. <laughs> now, what, what, like what, around what years is this? Like how common was it for your dad to be home with you? I didn't know anybody else who had a dad at home with them. It was totally unheard of. (laughs) Yeah. I had the coolest parents as far as anyone was concerned, and they were quite young. My mom was only 20 when I was born, so not only did I have this sort of atypical family arrangement uh, where my mom traveled most of the time. She worked for R.J. Reynolds Tobacco in their food services division, so she was gone mostly during the week, and then she would come home on weekends. So it was just a very different dynamic. But even though I knew it was unusual, I'm not sure that it really occurred to me how unusual it was probably till as late as college. Wow, interesting. And so what did you and your dad make when you, you were using the sewing machine? Uh, we made things like boat covers and car seats. We made He would make costumes and... Um, you know, we didn't have a lot of money, so it was a lot of found materials. We'd go to thrift stores at the Goodwill, and uh, he'd rip out the crinolines because I decided I wanted to be some sort of warrior that wore pink and poofy things along with armor. Cool. Um, he, uh, yeah, so we did lots of things like that. I mean, everything from very, very practical, heavy-duty materials to, you know, he would just help me and help my sister and, and siblings figure out how to just accomplish whatever it is you were interested in doing Um, yeah do you feel like that stayed with you in terms of your approach to quilting yeah I think it definitely stayed with me um I'm not afraid to try things I'm very process oriented I try to break things down and understand how they work um and it definitely affected me as a scientist so I'm very process oriented I I can, you know, I have a pretty good ability to to break down those kind of processes and understand them because I'm a biologist. You're a biologist. So amazing. You are not the first scientist we've been interviewing. It's kind (laughs) of interesting. I've been listening. (laughs) What's that about, right? There's a lot of you out there that, like, what is it about quilting that scientists like? Because there are a bunch of you. Yeah. I think probably different parts for different ones. In listening to the interviews, it seems to me there are people for whom the math, the geometry, Um, allows them to sort of express a type of creativity but uses their sort of strong mathematical foundation yeah I think for others it seems like there's like a separation where in your daily life maybe it's very rigid and you have to follow a set of rules or a plan or a lab uh, protocol and then quilting allows them to have sort of this very artistic bent 
That's so interesting, um, right? What about for, for me, you? Yeah. yeah, and for me, I would say it definitely was. I s- sort of formally started quilting because I wanted to m- push myself to get beyond needing everything to be symmetrical and staying within a very defined geometry. I, my mom is actually a very gifted artist and I had watched her do these amazing things, but I can't pick up a crayon and draw anything. Like my eight-year-old is a better artist than I am. That's really <laughs> in that interesting. Way. So I wanted a way to like be artistic and creative, but I knew I had to do it in a way that didn't rely on my ability to like pluck an image out of my head and create a figurative piece. That's really interesting. Um, what do you, so what do your quilts look like then? Um, can I see them online? Where? Yeah, I have a blog. Um, it's very small. Uh, it's called Crafty by Nature Blog. Crafty, uh, Crafty by Crafty Nature. By nature Blog. Dot WordPress. Dot com. And there's a few of my more recent things. I would okay, say I'm, I kind I'm, of do hold on. Whatever. I'm going there. Just a second. Yeah. <laughs> Crafty. <laughs> I know. It's uh. So Crafty by Nature Blog. Dot WordPress. Oh, hold on. I didn't go com. to. I didn't put the blog part in, so I go to some weird oh, site. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that makes more sense. Okay. Uh, and if you go to the about page. Go to the about page. I'm going to. Those are just page. a few things I put up recently. Ah, lovely. Hey, they're very adorable. They're great. <laughs> all right. So there are all kinds of different things. There's um, art quilts. There's some cute bunny quilts. Mm-hmm. There's really cute bear quilt. Uh, uh was that? What is that? The baby quilt with the quilt as you go quilt, an owl quilt. Is that right? Am I the right? So page? The, the which is oh that so it actually has elephants on it. Elephants. Uh, the one that has a pattern that has the blocks on it, or do you mean? So there's yeah. bears. Elephants. Yes, I see the elephants. Yeah, yeah. There's elephants. Yes, elephants. Yeah. There's bears. Yes. Are those okay? I'm going to put a link to it on your page that we're making for you. Um, and tell me, first of all, why'd you start a blog? That's everybody has blogs. I'm curious. Or why, why did you start a page or a blog? Because I kept making stuff and giving it away and then forgetting what I made. Yeah. <laughs> and so for me, it was, it, it, I even sort of say this on my blog, this is as much just sort of a way for me to remember and keep track of, but also because I have a process bent, I sometimes find good tips or tricks along the way. And, um, I posted a few of those that that when I try to take on a project and I sort of figure out how everyone's doing it and and you know like with weighted blankets I found right. a diff- a slightly different way to do it that I just wanted to be available for people if they want to see some of those ideas. Right, right, because quilting is part of it I think even historically is about sharing. Does that seem like that that and so the blogging becomes a natural thing. But this I always think like where is the technology connecting to our historical past and in many ways we really were just always a sharing culture so this se- seems to fit right into that motif does that seem yeah I agree I mean I think it's in in some ways I think the blog for many people who are right we exist in a world where many of us have full-time jobs we have families we're sort of doing multiple things in our daily life that make it hard to go to a quilt meeting or sit around for four hours hand quilting or go yeah. to some of the more traditional ways right. women learn from each other in this skill so for me I think the blogging is a way that you can say here's what I'm doing and here's how I did it or here's what worked for me yeah it doesn't have quite the time commitment piece and um the sort of social aspect which I know really excites a lot of people but for for me, I just find the conversations I'm interested in having when I went to the local guilds, uh, we were in very different places. <laughs> yeah. In what way? Um, I think there, at the time, there was more of an, there was something of an age and sort of stage of life disparity. Yeah. Um, I think, I, I because I, appro- I, I don't, I don't think I approach quilting quite the same way as some people. For example, I use lots of recycled materials and upcycled materials. I break all of the rules about what you can do and what you can't do and how to assemble things. And that's really um, cool be- because I fundamentally, you know, my if you click around, you'll see pictures yeah. of my my sewing machine. You know, I, uh-huh. I have work on a vintage machine. It doesn't have a huge harp. Yeah. Um, I don't have an enormous amount of time, and so if I've got a, a like the quilt I did for my sister, you can see the picture of the one with the cathedral windows. Uh-huh. That's actually made in twenty-inch blocks as a quilt so as you go, interesting. which I then assembled because that's what I could reasonably free motion 
um, on my machine and the pattern allowed it. Now I'm right. in the process of a pattern for another gift quilt, which is like a series of half square triangles in a diamond pattern. And it wouldn't really allow it. It doesn't really allow a quilt as you go method. So I just have to approach the free motion on that a little differently. Yeah. So I just found the conversations, you know, what was where people were in their lives was quite different. There yeah. was a lot of sort of, I think, conservatism in these guilds about yeah. what was acceptable. What material. was acceptable. Right, right, right. Like what's reasonable, what's not reasonable. Right, right, right. Yeah. And so I'm also used to being a scientist, you know, there's a way in which scientists interact that's about discord and about conversation and, you know, asking questions about, well, how did you do that? And why did you do that? Right. And I think outside of the scientific community or folks are, it's the same in law, right? You're used to right. questioning people. Right. I the same process. For, that's right. Yeah, it's a process it thing. Can, exactly. I think that process of inquiry can be difficult in certain social settings because yeah. people think you're sort of attacking them but what yeah, you are there's a challenge to it it's interesting isn't yeah. it because we are trained people, I mean our discourses are, are different but we but are trained in a certain method of thinking that we as a community law science feel is completely acceptable and is not confrontational and right. yet when we're in the like reg, with regular people they do think it is because I think we're trained it's just so interesting, isn't it? Yeah. So yeah, it's it's a it's traditionally, I mean, using more traditional words, it's often a more male communication style. Yeah. Uh, and it's one that has, you know, so in those settings, you know, people who know me well call me infinitely curious. I could probably be given slime mold, and I would find it the most interesting thing in the world, and find <laughs> a way to be interested in it. It's just That's sort really of great. my nature. That's really and great. so you could talk to me about almost anything and part of it is to keep myself entertained during the talk yeah maybe not my first interest right but I engage with people and I ask them questions and I process things quickly um and so that I found in certain social settings that particularly around some of the quilting world that was difficult because I was picking up techniques very quickly not because I'm particularly smart but just because I tend to process quickly right um, and I was seeing that that when I was going to say some of the classes, that was really hard for other people who were trying to learn the technique because they started comparing themselves to me. That's that's problem, right? Because yeah, yeah, I get it. I totally get it. Yeah. So, is there like a group of like scientist quilters? You guys all have a group that you hang out in. You should totally have a group. You know, it would be so interesting, we right? We probably should. I mean, but it, you know, science is such a big world. I mean, my my part of science is really conservation science, so it's the applied side. Yeah. Although I have a pretty strong foundation in the basic stuff. Um, yeah. But the basic science being science for the sake of why. Yeah. So yeah, we probably should. And I, and I do follow some people that clearly come from that more scientific way. You know, the, 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 um, hip to be square, you know, yeah. Pam, it clearly comes from that engineering perspective. And, right. Um, you can kind of see that in her process. Now her process and mine aren't the same, right? but I understand the sort of way in which that, that works. So interesting. I, you know, when I first started this project, one of the things I wanted to do was do like an interdisciplinary um, uh, anthology of essays about like what is quilting. And you make me think about that again from like your perspective and my perspective and other perspectives of that are, you know, people, um, people that are in academics Mm -hmm. that, um, you know, we write for a living anyway to sort of think about sort of what is that thing. So we should, we should think about that. I think it would be really an interesting collection of what is quilting from these kind of different spaces of, you know. And I think a lot about copyright from your, pers- you know, where you're coming into this because I am, I am a phenomenal editor and reviser. Interesting. I am, I cannot sit down. If you told me draw a bear. Yeah. I, I could not sit down and draw it. But if you gave me a bear, I can free motion quilt over it and make it look realistic or I could change it. it the end product might look nothing like that. Yeah. But I, I sort of need that jumping off point. And so I think a lot about, you know, because I use images. Right. How do I start from that? And I'm very fortunate to have a huge number of professional biologists whose photographs I can use with their permission. As oh, that's my cool. Off point. Yeah. But, but it's, it's hard when you, you know, when I see something and I'm like, well, I know that I'm going to change that, but I want to make sure that I'm respectful. And that's, I think, another way in which sort of law and science approached quilting probably similarly, which may not suit all, which is my experience, you know, my base is in you give full attribution. Right. 
And yeah, that's just what we do because we cite right. things. We're a cite- We're citers. So and it doesn't it's completely think, yeah. fine in my field to take somebody else's data set. So they're literally yeah. their numbers and reanalyze it your own way. That's really interesting. Right. And, right. and so I think some, you know, when I approach quilting, which had this art, art form, I started trying to understand how are people doing this? Because I was seeing them, their version of citing was very different than what I would think. And there was a lot of, there's, you know, your whole, all these podcasts have been about like sort of how do you give credit right. and I and, and to the extent that it's similar both in science and in law and probably other fields yeah. people are making their living in those things but the culture in which it occurs is here take my data and reanalyze right. it or you know tear apart my legal analysis of right. this important environmental case right. and analyze it your own way right and we have I mean for law all of the cases that happen and the statutes are in the public domain so so mm-hmm. we're very used to, and the, and we're supposed to take specific language it's language based so is yours mm-hmm. right so that you don't yeah. like change the language because that's, that's right. key yeah so you always have that you know? monitor in your brain saying yeah. are these my words or are these words i heard in a paper to make sure you go back and properly cite that paper right and i'm trained as a cultural historian so history if you put history back into this it, we also use all kinds of resources. The whole point is to find resources and comment and criticize them. Yeah. Make them your own. I mean, make, you know, you know, use your own words to express it. Don't just, you know, plop somebody's stuff in. But mm-hmm. but we're, we're using those, res- those resources all the time. So it's so interesting that that is the nature of these fields. Um, and then you get to cop, then you get to quilting and it's like, it has that same thing. It's got a huge amount of public domain material. And then as you said, this new material and how do you use the new material? I would love to talk about tr- turtle heyday and that you merge two patterns together. And I found that super interesting. So you kind of, you talk about, you've got two patterns at the top um, that are, um, and, and they're one's a, two different, one has turtle pattern, one is like another pattern, but it's got different, uh, I guess, hedgehogs or some sort of animal in it. Hedgehog, yeah. right, I got it. Um and then you made your own pattern and you took bits of each of the patterns and you put it into uh, EQ7, which is a software program in case people don't know. Tell me about the process and what your thoughts were about it. And you made this quilt that's completely adorable. So tell me a little bit about your thoughts about that and why you did it that way. Well, I, I have a coworker. This was actually a baby quilt for my coworker who is the turtle biologist for the state of that's Massachusetts. So, cool. <laughs> so, of course, it had to have turtles. Right. And... I found each of these quilts and I liked portions of both of them. So I purchased uh, one's an actually in a book and one's a, 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 pat, a book, actually both are books. I purchased both of the books so that I could respect that this was their design work. Right. And so that's, let's just pause there. That's super huge, right? So you, you purchased it. That's where the market, that's where the, that's, that's where they get their money from purchasing the pattern. And so the fact that you purchased them is a really good start, I would say. Right, you didn't yeah, and like. I, I, I kind of read in the book about you know like other when you go to say a, a photo website like Flickr, it'll say can you make derivative works, and nothing in these books were really clear about whether I could make a derivative work. Right. So I said, well, I'm gonna fully cite everything. I bought the patterns, and then yeah. I went into EQ7 and just sort of played around with it to get it in the general vein of what I wanted, and uh, so that I could piece it more efficiently. Yeah. No, it's really cool. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, I mean, that's really interesting, right? So what kind of rights are we be, are we being given when we buy a pattern? Because it does seem like there's an implied, obviously there's an implied license to make it, but then the question is, is there applied license to deviate from it and make a derivative work? And I think there has to be, right? Like, well, I feel like even if you just change the block size, let's say it was scaled at a four inch block and you make it an eight inch block. I assume a designer knows that could happen, but, you know, I really, I did think about it. This is before your podcast about the fact that I was going to make this derivative work. Um, And I sort of, you know, said, well, the best thing I can do is give everybody all the credit they're due and make it very clear that the only creative part I really employed was in fabric choice and how I combine the parts. Yeah. I mean, and that's, that gets its own separate copyright, right? That you do create a derivative derivative work because you have the selection arrangement and coordination of those parts and then the question is 
Is that okay? Now, of course it's okay, right? Because you're giving it to somebody as a gift. So nobody cares, right? Nobody cares. Right. Like, does it matter? Not at all. Not even a little bit. Did they get their money out of it? Yeah, you bought both books. So, right, but what if I had sold this? I mean, I've had, had people ask it? me to make commission pieces and right. usually those, like, you know, I... I will very rarely take those on just because of time. Yeah. But, you know, it was sort of the questioning I was having for myself. And I've been so interested to hear in the podcast because I'm not sure I know the answer if I could do that. Right. So whether I had done it from an individual pattern or had merged them. Yeah. It's, I think, I think that's a good question. I mean, I think that it comes down. I mean, there's all kinds of like you've, it's amazing everybody's opinion on all this. So it go it runs the gamut. It isn't like there is it's copyright law is not about like it is not a stop sign. It is not obvious all the time. So that with that said, it seems like if you're not mass producing, like low commercial use, people don't care about. As long as the designer is getting their the money you would have paid them for that. Now so I would think even a commission would be okay because you're you're being paid for your sewing. Um, and you're using these two and you've already bought the book. Now, I've always asked them is like, why don't you have like a licensing scheme, like a space that allows people to license them for like, you know, three bucks or whatever to do things that are these low commercial uses. It seems like there's a market failure there for um, for guilds, for Etsy shops, for all kinds of things that if they really did want to capture that income, they could by having either a you know universal licensing scheme or just on the pa- the package saying if you want to do commission works you know please contact me or if you're a guild please contact me on the right, but in a way we know. all use this language right we all say well they don't care right. which means it's more a threshold for action right it's yeah. it's not worth it for somebody to come after you on these generally small individual cases but that's not really to me defining what is probably defined by law and yeah. or practice. Right. That's really like if I stay below the radar. Right. And- exactly. That's exactly it. But the thing that's so interesting about this is that they do care. So when we talk to pattern makers, they do care that people are ma- – and they have a different level of caring, right? Some some don't care if you make five copies or some people – you know, they all care in different ways. So there's a few that don't care at all. But they're making, not making their money off of the patterns necessarily, right? That's usually what happens is they're like, well, I don't really care because that's not where my the bulk of my income is. Mm-hmm. But there is market failure. So you think about like, remember like um, uh, when there was uh, peer-to-peer downloading and there was no, you know, everybody was uploading their CDs and like there was chaos, right? Napster, Grokster, all that. But there was no legal mechanism. There was no way, there was no licensing scheme put in place until that market was made and everybody got sued and all that kind of stuff but you think about all that illegal downloading and illegal uploading and all that stuff but now we have iTunes right now we have Spotify we have these businesses in place that it makes it much more convenient to just go get you know buy you know do it for 9.95 a month or whatever um, or buy the the album we don't have that with patterns so it'll be interesting to see if that ever develops you know, where, I mean, in some way it's bad, in some way it's good, but I don't understand why that part isn't in place, you know? Yeah. And I think there's different, like there's different layers, even in a pattern and it comes out in the various podcasts where, you know, so one of these is basically a windmill block and it's a slightly modified one, the one with the letters in the windmill. Yeah. And you know, that pattern, that the, the physical arrangement of those parts is in, is in the public domain. The specific color choices were inspired by this designer's choices and my fabrics that I had available. Yeah. Um, and, and then, so there's the whole quilt piece, but then in addition, these books had written instruction. So I, you know, I couldn't reproduce the written instruction, but you know, I wonder sometimes like if I'm following their recipe of how to do it yeah. and then I do it on my own in a, in an unrelated way, you know, it just feels like, it, it seems like in science and law, like the rules of how you're supposed to do this are very clear. Yeah. <laughs> and right. I find in, in this art form, it's, it's not it's hard. And, you know, and I, if I had, if I had actually been making this as a commission, I probably would have contacted the book publishers. And have you ex- done that before? Do they respond? Because that's the other question is like, what happens when you do contact them? What do they say? You know, I've had, I've done it twice. And in one case, it was a very large publishing house and I never got a response. And so I just chose a different avenue for that project. 
And in another case, it was a relatively small publishing house. And they said, yeah, you're absolutely welcome to do it. Can you just send me a picture of your final thing? Because I'd love to see how you decided to modify what I had done. Yeah. Um, and I think that's, you know, that, and so I suspect there's everything in between, but also, you know, my commercial livelihood is not right. dependent on this. And I think that's kind of where, I think it's when commercialism has entered quilting and that's not in a judgmental way. It's just yeah. as people have started to make a living in this industry, I think that's why there's some confusion and people are making livings at all these different levels right, from, right. from simple publishing of the pattern. But if I'm a, but if I'm a fabric maker, we, you've talked to a large fabric maker. They said, well, we publish free patterns because we just want people to use our fabric. Right. <laughs> right. Right. So, so, so you have two people in the industry, both producing patterns, both, but one may be free and one may be paid and they may feel very differently because the work product they care about, the thing they're making money off of differs. Right. Well, it seems, okay, so your, your quilt is so insanely adorable. I'll pick, put it up. Oh, but it's thanks. just great, right? So you could see that, like, if there was a way to get, like, if you put your quilt up for someone to, to use, your version of it, and then you were paying, like, 50 cent royalty to each of the pattern makers, that would make a lot of sense, right, to me. It's like I used, you know, as long as they had like a Creative Commons license that said I could create a derivative work and whatever, or if you create derivative works, you have to share the pattern in some way, or whatever they wanted to do. But it seems such a shame that your version will just be made this one time and that other people won't make it, you know? That part, that's the part that makes me a bit sad today, because I think your pattern is so cool. Um, yeah, I, I think you know? the way I look, that's kind of the blog aspect where... I, if somebody produced a pattern exactly like this, they, they would have to choose different colors because, like, the green is actually a sheet, so good luck finding exactly yeah. that. But if they produce the exact thing, if I, I have no – I don't take ownership of this layout because I know I used a, a commercial layout. I would be bothered if they didn't then go buy the books. Yeah. So if I saw them making it, even for individual use – um, and, and in talking with them, discovered, well, they hadn't bought the original pattern. Then I feel like, well, if my pattern was inspired by these two books, then your use of my pattern is. So you should go buy those books. Yeah. Um, because that's respectful of the designer. Now, let me ask you a question. How much do you think? Let's look to, let's put our other hat, the others, the flip side of it. So one is um, a bunch of strips. So the original one is um, turtles and frames on one side, and then uh, th then the background is strips of like probably two inch strips or two and two and a half inch strips or I don't know, like some sort of strippy thing. Um, and then the other one has a pinwheel and sort of the pinwheel in the mid middle, and then sort of like. I don't know. It's like um, pulled on point. So anyway, my thing is like, how much is that their creativity? How much weight should we be giving to the original designer? That's the part that I can't quite understand in this. Because the stuff that they're doing isn't completely original either. So how do you feel about that part of it? Like, yes, you happened upon their design and yes, you used that. But we don't know where their, their inspiration came from or what they're relying on. Or we could. We could sort of d dissect that in some way. But what do you think about that part? I think that's, it gets, so one, I try, I probably try not to think that hard yeah. <laughs> sometimes, but I mean, I think it's, it's very true that, I mean, the layout, the hedgehog, the physical layout of where the blocks on point and setting triangles and applique in the border, that whole concept yeah. is nothing unique. Nothing unique. But, Right. But what brought the unique element was they did bring their own unique applique and then their design and color scheme. But you didn't use um, that part. And no. you didn't use the applique part in the border either. So No. <laughs> right. So what you took was and you didn't even use their layout actually because you did four pinwheels and they had one. Mm -hmm. So you're taking kind of the idea and also they have things going kind of uh, diagonal and you're doing it not diagonal so you're taking you're doing this the more we I look at this the more it's you're inspired by this but you're not this is kind of your own this is completely your own design like there's no way this is so I've been just looking at the cases the, the courts are really weird so the courts are like okay they they first they were like it's with the big case is this alphabet quilt where they do like 
the alphabet, like, I think it's, like, four across or five across, and it's just, like, A, B, C, D, and then the, the, at the end, they have, like, little icons to fill in where the alphabet ended. And so the court finds, and then the first quilt that, that's infringing, they use almost exactly the same color scheme, right? Exactly. But then they start to make, this, this company starts to make other ones where they put the icons after the, you know, like, A, B, C icon and D, E, whatever, and they use different different colors, and the court is, like... Yeah, this isn't the same quilt. Like, it takes so little for this court, at least, to be like, yeah, they're totally different. Like, these aren't infringing at all. So now I look at your words, and I think, except the turtles. The turtles are a different situation. But the the layout from that first one, that that to me seems inspired by. That doesn't seem like it's infringing at all to me. From what the – because the court – because an ordinary person would be like, these are two different quilts. These are very different quilts. Yeah, I think it, this is sort of my, again, coming from a science and uh, I do environmental regulation, so I have a little bit of a legal background. It's it's that attribution spec. I know when I looked at that quilt, yeah. that layout, that it inspired this. Totally. That and you're inspired so, by that. And then the right, turtles, so, did you take the turtles seem like they're... They're, they're directly from, the pattern. Right. So those are just you know direct copying that's yeah. totally f- i mean i'm so you can sort of see the difference one's inspired by one is the art from those turtles um and you know if you were selling them commercially that there, there'd be a problem probably but you're not you're just making a baby quilt for somebody and you're putting up sort of go buy this turtle book thing um that's so interesting though isn't it i think that's really interesting yeah the court would say i mean i would think that a court would say you're not infringing on the second pattern that's inspired by, and the first one is direct copying. So, like, if you were mass producing this in China or something, mm-hmm. that that would be the issue, and then they'd be like, "Yeah, you you, you, took, you took the turtles." Um, but there's no way for you to go get a. Let's say you did want to make a bunch of these. There's no way for you to get a tur- a license for those turtles. No, I, I would I would assume I'd have to call, contact the book publisher and right. see. Right, and the book publisher would be like, "What? Right?" Right. <laughs> Right? You're like, I want a license to be able to make 10 turtle quilts for my friends and sell them at a charity auction or something, right? Whatever. Right. Low commercial well, use. Parts of that conversation have always been historically happening. I mean, right, so so we're thinking about it in a commercial space, and yeah. that's, I think, what drives these questions. But historically, when when women were quilting, I mean, not everybody was sitting in their unheated cabin using this for sheerly practical purposes. Right. The quality of the materials you had available. So if you were on the wealthy end and you had silk dresses and right. silk materials available to you, they were bringing them over on ships and bolts. So those, even the cottons they could get would be different. So the quality of your stitching. So how small did you stitch? Right. Right. Um, there are a whole, you know, in novels, it's been, and in actually historical things, if you read, um, I read Eliza Pickney's paper. She was an indigo. Uh, she, she created the indigo industry in the South. Um, and, uh, so, you know, there was this whole conversation she was having about, well, they went to some fair and somebody borrowed, took somebody else's quilt design from the previous year. And it was this whole like hubbub about it. So interesting. And so I think these historical questions and it's not new to quilting. It, it exists. Right. That it's not just commercialism. It is right of attribution, artistry, yeah. and like, you know, territory in some way. Right. And, and so in that case, you know, like there were people who's, that, you know, you were judged on how small your stitches is. My mom is in her mid sixties and her aunt was a milner. So made, you know, handmade hats. Uh-huh. And so my mother was taught to make very fine, very careful stitches. So if she, if my handwork and her handwork were, were in a historical moment where it mattered, she would mm-hmm. totally get the better husband than me. <laughs> <laughs> because oh my, my handwork is terrible. <laughs> like that. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's very funny. So these these ways of judging, in a way, it's like sort of, you know, there's this other aspect of handwork, which has always been about sort of judging the quality of the person, judging the quality of the family. Yeah. Um, you know, and, right. and that that is not unique to fabric work. That was in cabinet work or in other sort of things that men did as well. They're, yeah. They're, you know, how well can you do this thing? And that puts you in a, in a range of acceptability. Right. So interesting. All right, we so we totally blew through the half hour thing. So, <laughs> <laughs> see, I try. I can't I try. say I'm ever known for short conversations. <laughs> All right, so let's look. Um, let's just spend a couple more minutes on gender. We talked about gender. You said you had boys. You're taught by your dad. 
So what role does gender play in this conversation? Well, there's a couple ways it presents. You know, one is that I think if you're teaching boys versus girls how to sew and every child, you, you teach the child you have. But in general, they, you know, my son certainly approaches sewing very differently than when I've taught my niece. Um, Why? He, In what way? He wants to, he, it's a machine. It makes noise. He wants to make it go fast. Um, he, I had to figure out a finger guard system because his hand could fit under the foot. I had never had to think about this with my niece. Really? Uh, no. But my son adores My Little Pony. He likes rainbows. So his visual interest, and you know, who knows who he'll be, he'll be when he's an adult, but his visual interest is clearly in that world. And so you have a it's trying to find ways for him to express that. Um, but his approach to sewing is different. Like he would have no problem gluing the fabric down if he got the outcome where my, my niece and other girls I've taught are more interested in the process. Like they want to know, like, how do I do it the right way? Yeah. Um, it's, it's just a very different approach. And That's I think really interesting. For, do you know, we th- talk about untapped markets, right? We want the quilting yeah. world to grow and people keep talking about children. And I think that's really powerful to think about. But I think we also need to think about this kind of a hard, hard, hard thing to phrase without getting people up in arms. But right, the quilting has historically been, and I still think is largely a female endeavor. Women have a lot of power. We influence. We are big influencers in what tools are made, how they're made, what sewing, what options are available in sewing machines. Yeah. Um, I'm six feet tall as a female, and I can tell you, sewing machines are not made for people who are six feet tall. That's really interesting. They're, they're made for somebody who's shorter because I have a I have a problem using some machines where it's hard for me to see past the head to the sewing space because I'm taller than they're expecting. That's really interesting. I had never thought about that. That's so interesting. Yeah. So I think if, I think as an, as a culture, as a quilting world, first I think people need to think about like, is this a world in which we want to shape it to be more inviting for men and boys? Right. right? There are definitely men in the industry, but they're finding a crack here and there. And I think that would start with, we would have to have totally different language. I mean, I'm, I'm always interested. I, I go to people's, you know, I join a Facebook group or, or some other group. The first thing everyone says is be nice. Right. Right. We do. I totally respect that. Right. But that's not language that is typically used in male endeavors. No, it's play so true. fair. Right. You might yeah. tell a boy to play fair. Um, Their ideas about what is typical conversation, you know, what's acceptable is different, how they communicate. My my best friend and I have had this running joke, you know, where how boys and girls communicate differently. So if I was a, if I, if I met you and my greeting to you was to grab you in a wrestling hold, put you in a headlock and give you noogies, that would not be socially acceptable because, right, that's female to female. But in a lot of boys and men, that's exactly how they, they show physical affection. Yeah. And so to the extent that... Well, here's this- the thing, though. So, because I, you you and I both live in probably... I'm, I'm, not, I'm, just, I'm doing too much assumptions. My world is... So our faculty is, um, like, I think there's 10 tenure or tenure track women and 20, 28 men, right? So um, I live in a very male-focused world. Even though our, our, our students are 50-50 um, and sometimes more women than men, um, not our faculty. Mm-hmm. And so I like the discourse of quilting right now. I like the space of where it is. Um, how do we keep that sort of dominant, like what the rules are? Um, I don't want it to become like my work space, you know? Right. So that's the thing of like inviting. Sure, I'm totally cool with inviting people in and, and being inclusive. But I also like the space we have, which is very female dominated you know yeah well in listening to the various podcasts and listening to, and interacting with i know a number of men that are quilters uh i would say they do it as one of the many things they do including sewing bags and tool cases um it's it's this conversation we have and i think it's sort of where you and i began today is like we're trained in a different conversational style yeah and um, and I've certainly seen that be totally fine with some people and tough for others. Yeah. But I've been thought, thinking about I have this incredible little boy. He's eight and he is you know wanting to express his creativity and you know sort of seems to be interested in things because we've never said oh well pink is for girls right. and purple is for 
you know, yeah, I, I care that's less. Good. Like he's right? going to be who he's going to be and I'm going to love him every day of his life. So that's just the way it is. Right. Um, but if I want, you know, if he does want to get into this industry, right. you know, where does that fit? Where does he fit? You know, yeah. Right. I was thinking of, you know, Seth was saying yeah. um, from, you know, how he's a part of a men's quilting group. And I, right. I thought to myself, gosh, I'd love to just be a fly on the wall and right. listen to the conversation. Totally. Me too. And Me is too. my perception of the likely difference real or, you know, is it really happening the way I would imagine, which is the way conversations happen, what's considered acceptable norms differ? Right. Or is it my perception, right? Am I bringing a, a sense of bias into this perception right. of how gender equality can be expressed in quilting. Right. And is it just the nature of the craft that yeah. is it is the is it the discourse of the craft or is it the discourse of those in the craft? Um, sort of right. thing. How does that influence? Because right. those hum- we're all embedded in our own culture, like yourself. I have always yeah. been in a male dominated field. Yeah. Um, I have to say, I probably didn't personally experience some of the challenge of my peers. I am six feet tall, and I'm more right. of Amazonian proportions. Yeah. And so, frankly, I don't. Yeah, it helps. But you know, there are times when I we we're doing field work, and I would have a, a male field assistant. And he would absolutely insist on carry. We had two, uh, when you're collecting fish, when you're uh-huh. doing research, you use ele- backpack electroshockers. Uh, and we had an old one, which was basically a car batter on a battery on a metal frame. You had to hike into the woods. Or we had a, a, a nice sleek one that was maybe half the weight. And he insisted on carrying the old one. And I just was like, if it makes you feel better, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> it's I just, so weird, right? Yeah. And there, yeah. there are definitely, you know, so I think, I've always been sort of even keeled about it. Yeah. I definitely had a harder time in high school with the fact that I was a very bright student and yeah. I was female and I explicitly had a physics teacher in high school who would find every way he could grade me down because he didn't want the girl to be the highest scorer in the class. Really? That's yeah. ridiculous, right? Yeah, my That's mom so my mom wasn't playing that game. My yeah, mom definitely yeah, mom gave him a hard time. <laughs> right. Right. The times my mom went to the principal's office over things like that. Oh, yeah. Well, and, you know, my mom was, she was a, a vice president of R.J. Reynolds Tobacco at a time when, if there were any other women, yeah. I didn't know of them. Yeah. So she was in a male-dominated world. And yeah, she just, that's huge. You know, we, it was always, for me, it's always been about, you know, everyone has to do their best, whatever that best is. I don't care if you're purple. <laughs> like, right. just do, do your best. And, uh right. Being a field biologist, you definitely get a, a bit of a tough skin about you. Um, totally. And but those gender issues come up quite a lot, and they're sometimes quite subtle. They are subtle. Um, I think they're harder it, when they're subtle. I mean, I think about like I mean, yeah. not to denigrate anything about the Me Too movement because it's huge, but there's so much more as well, and it's the more part, the subtle stuff, that is so impossible to address or anything, right? Like. Yeah. If you're like, oh, well, that was super gendered just now, the people are like, what? I'm like, yeah, it, it was, right? <laughs> like, yeah. like it, yeah. it's pretty obvious. Um, but they don't see, but people don't, it's harder. It's just, you know, I think about like, you know, the difference between trying to get the vote and then trying to have social equality is, you know, one, it was very hard to get the vote, no doubt. But then the next step, we're still struggling with it, right? Oh, Since yeah. This is ridiculous. Yeah, I think one of the senators, you know, you know, it's like sort of like what's the questions we're interested in? I won't get into politics, but um, yeah, I think for me, it's always been, um, you know, I my I have a undergrad uh, honors project. You know, I studied feminist theory, so I definitely come from a feminist background in, as well as being a scientist. But you know, and then I look at this little boy, and I was suddenly you know having right. to question and say, well, how do I bring right. this little boy up into the world huge right and it's that, huge. Yeah, you see those challenges and, and right and it it's a really interesting thing as a to question our own assumptions yeah about these it really things. is well, but I do are... wonder you know going to some of these quilt guilds with people who are at a different life stage and I listen to their conversations and what's important to them and and that's really powerful for them and I think to myself well I'm not sure from you know, for, if it's difficult for me to see commonality, um, you know, I, if we, it's a question, I think, for the quilting industry to think about is, yeah. you know, if you want to invite men and boys some, for at least Americans, which tend to be tall, you're talking, you have to change your machines. I love it. The, yeah. The distance to the buttons, the size of the buttons. Yeah. Like I, you know, I don't have tiny little hands. My mom right. has a size five finger. I don't. Right. <laughs> so, right. you know, 
lots of things like that would would change and then if that happened would would women still love this incredible space where we are these in a sense, in many ways we're the power brokers of the design right and now and what about output. design and fabric do you feel like there's things out there for your kid or do you feel like that also is lacking I think there's a huge lack of gender neutral stuff so if you're a little boy that likes unicorns and uh rainbows yeah the, they might have a, a rainbow unicorn which is awesome but it's always in a pink or purple background right um now he doesn't he's generally pretty okay with that but he does get frustrated sometimes he's like why does everything have to be pink and purple yeah mine did too so i have a um a kid who's uh who identifies as um, non-binary and loved everything boys and girls stuff and like we from the very beginning um and even then we struggle with like why does that have to you know does it always have to be pink right like why does it have to be so i completely get that you know this should we don't we don't need First of all, we should stop making pink girl stuff. Like, that would be a really nice thing. Like, the idea that, like, everybody should like pink and, you know, the girl aisle shouldn't be all pink. That, that's a whole big thing. But um, it's kind of interesting. Now, two things. We have wanted to, we're and we've only got a few minutes because I have a thing at 10. Um, this is such a great conversation. Just so, I mean, this has been so much fun. Um, so a couple of projects we're thinking about that I would love for you to be involved with maybe. Um, first, we're potentially doing some conversations about youth and sewing um, starting after Thanksgiving. And we're going to be talking to kids and programs that sort of focus on youth and sewing. So it'd be really cool to, if your kid wanted to be on, um, to talk with him about his, like, what makes what he likes and what he wishes were there and all that. Um, so that's the first thing is that we're trying to create a, we're also, some people have said with this project that we're may, maybe we're thinking about like a space where, um, kids can come for like a, you know, a week to New Orleans or, um, you know, giving spaces to kids that really do want to learn because the other thing is that they don't have access to teachers in the same way because teachers don't cater like really awesome teachers. Not that the teachers that teach kids aren't awesome, but like the top teachers in the fields don't cater to kids. So have giving them opportunity to really, you know, sort of who is the fu- who are our future people and, and giving them opportunities to, to play. So what do you think about that um, project? I think it's a great thing. Um, I think my kid in particular would spend all the time talking about Minecraft and blowing stuff up. That's fantastic, though. That's <laughs> the point. Right? And does he do Minecraft quilts? <laughs> Minecraft quilts are great, right? There's tons yeah. of them, right? So, so he's really only gotten to the point where he can kind of maintain his focus to – he mostly wants to tell me what he wants me to make him. That's okay. <laughs> That's good, too. But, um, That's okay. But, yeah, so he's, yeah. he's No, I'm okay with that. Into, so he's got all the – I have, like, ten pillows I'm making, and I, I have a whole stack of, of designs that he's said, these are the things I want you to make, Mommy. That's great. <laughs> That's fabulous, right? I mean, he'll I think forget, that's Hopefully he'll too. forget about some of them, so obviously right. I don't have to make them all. <laughs> right. We did a couple of Minecraft blocks, and then my kid finally wasn't that into Minecraft, and I was kind of relieved because yeah. they were okay. My Minecraft blocks were okay, but not um, yeah. stellar. Um, okay, so that's our first project. And then the other one we're working on, and I don't know if we'll air this. I might edit this out because um, we haven't really announced it totally, um, is my kid – I took her to this um, – uh, the protest, like, uh, craft activism thing. And so um, in Atlanta, and she came back wanting to do a project on um, the kids that were lost at the border. And so there's an idea of trying to do lost and found quilts um, of, like, to really sort of visualize how many kids are missing and what happened to them. And so that's another project we're thinking about. But we haven't quite figured out what that project is. But again, I don't know if it's kids making the quilts or grown-ups making quilts or everybody or kids and grown-ups together making quilts, like a family quilt. Um, but that might be something to think about is too, if you're interested. And I think for I think that that might have sort of a – I think for, for kids who are not in that immigrant community, yeah. it might be the older kids that kind of are ready. So sort of preteen to teen might right. – know enough about the world to understand what that fits right. and but i suspect that there are children in the immigrant community where that's their daily life i mean yeah I, right um you know so yeah so i mean we haven't quite figured that one out again we're thinking about doing that after thanksgiving like starting that project um but um you know her thing was like she wanted to make enough have 
a bunch of people donate quilts so that we can physicalize how many children have been are missing. Right. Well, it's like um, the AIDS quilt idea, you know, the idea of the AIDS quilt when, exactly. you know, I was, I was a teenager when all yeah. that was happening, when it yeah. really became public was the ability to actually vision, it, it right. was a heartfelt way of people to express the loss, but it was also a way to visualize, like, right. this is not three people that nobody's ever heard That's of. Right. That's right. That's right. I mean, it's that was a, a huge event, a, a big social phenomenon, huge. not just the AIDS quilt, but the AIDS conversation when I was in college, especially. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it was powerful to see, you know, it's powerful. I'm, I'm 46 yeah. and I think I, I still see the photographs and I get teary thinking about yeah. that. And I do have friends who have AIDS. So, yeah, um, it's kind so of I remarkable, think- isn't that that. So I was I'm just about five years older than you. And I um, it is powerful and, and seeing bits of it or seeing all of it and sort of what they did to change that dialogue of what it meant um, is huge. And the fact that they're still around now, obviously they have preservation issues and all that other things, but it was such an important conversation to be having. um, And that was a really interesting way to do it. So, yeah. yeah. I love the idea of representing the lost children, uh, whether it's in that realm or other children that kind of get lost in the system. Yeah. um, Because I think that they are lost and we don't, people don't think about them and and people don't want to think about it. No. Um, but there's a, it's not up anymore, but for a while there was a fence on my way to work I would pass and uh, a person was keeping count of the number of immigrants in detention, uh, just in huge numbers on their fence. Wow. Um, it, it's come down now, but it was a really interesting thing to pass and it was, it was a counter. Basically, you could just see it going up very quickly. Horrible. Um, and I think those numbers are like, a number is hard, easier than a list and I think well, how, well, what does that number look like? Not many what people can realize, like? well, what does 10,000 look like? Yeah. What does 10,000 look like? That's right. It's yeah. kind of remarkable. And um, so I don't know what we're doing with that project. We got donation of fabric already for it. We got to sort of think about what we're doing. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we're sort of having those conversations. So those are the next projects I think that are on board, but I would love to connect with you and see. Yeah how you'd like to play and also obviously I still think we should have conversations or a conference at some point that brings together all of us to talk about what this is um, and how it relates to our academic fields because I think it's so interesting that there are so many I was just thinking you know you had mentioned in another podcast how a lot of scientists what we do in our quilting world is either there's there was the one woman who was very very connected she was doing those gorgeous maps right and then other people, it's quite separate. And I would say mine is sort of a little bit connected because I do love including wildlife images in my in what I do. Right. Part of that's my interest. Part of it's probably the world in which people I'm giving baby quilts are right. all often in the field. Um, and I, I actually didn't, I don't have a picture of it, but I made a, a free motion embroidery piece for my mom with some images that were powerful for her. And, um but yeah, I was thinking about like, how does my, I, I see my science impacting quilting more. I was always thinking about it was the process, but it's clear like in the images and in the things I like, I think it's more embedded, but maybe not quite as overtly as something. Yeah, or no, just it's so math. true, isn't it? <laughs> well, I really like your quilts. I think they're awesome. I really wow, do. Thank you. And you do, you do machine applique for the animals. Is that how you're doing them? Yeah. And I use, um, I don't. I have no strict adherence to any technique. So these happen to be, um, I think I did freezer paper applique where I turned the edges. So when I'm making something for a baby, I try to be quite conscious of not having uh, exposed threads that could catch little fingers, Aww. you know, because they're they're too little to know, like I should take my finger out from that tight space. Right. Um, and I try to make, and so these are usually, I, I tend to quilt densely just because I'm a free motion person, but I tend to quilt pretty densely with baby things. Interesting. Um, but I don't, I wouldn't say like I'm an applique lover. It's, it's to me, it's like, well, this is the outcome I want. What's the yeah. best way for me to get there? And what process can I apply to this? I, you know, it still has three layers, um, but how do I get those layers together? So if yeah. I have a giant quilt and then up until a week ago, I had just this small machine. I actually just bought a Juki oh, mid arm. Oh, cool. Which, uh, which one? So it's the new Miyabi, which yeah. is essentially their QVP 2200 with a few extra whistles and bells. That's very cool. And, I have uh, uh, two Jukis. I love them. They're not, yeah, we, it's, we're not, it's, we don't. So which one is it that you got? 
So uh, I think if you, it's the new one, but it's very, it's it's the clone of the QVP twenty two hundred. Got it. And it so it's the mid arm sit down. Yeah. It was sort of the competitor of the HQ Sweet sixteen. Yeah. Uh, but the nice thing about this model, one, it was affordable uh-huh. uh, with a lot of saving, but also it can go straight onto a frame. Oh, that's great. Uh, yeah. Because I don't have room for a frame in my very small yeah. Victorian house. Right. <laughs> But one day I might. <laughs> one day you might. <laughs> so I wanted the flexibility. And uh, yeah. it's been great. You know, I just I just finished a, a cool thing, a piece, the, this gift I'm making for my boss who's retiring. And um, yeah, having that extra space was key. <laughs> yeah, but it's so amazing, that, you know, right? If I wanted to do that, it, well, I can't. No. It's painful to manhandle a king-size quilt oh, through it's a impossible. small machine. Yeah, it's and, totally impossible. And because I like to figure things out on my own, I, I eventually found a method to do that, which is I slash my batting. Um, so I'm not manhandling all the batting at once. And I uh-huh. design it so that you are oh, that's working. that's so cool. So you're putting part of it in, and then you put the other part in yeah. when you're ready to get to the next part? Right. That's so right. cool. And that's like the, the probably the hundredth time I've discovered something somebody else already knew how to do. And I, I love it, though. Uh, that's great. And that's same so thing great. with some of the other quilt as you go techniques. You know, yeah. I've... Some of them, there are ways I do it that are very similar to the ways people do it. There's probably some ways, because yeah. I don't follow the rules. Like, I might yeah. do a portion of a quilt that's quilt as you go, uh-huh. I'm, but it may be traditionally pieced. So, like these, the turtle heyday you were looking at, the, the pinwheels are traditionally pieced. Yeah. And then I put them down on the block and quilt them down. Yeah. Um, so, and yeah. I've done any, and I also use sometimes if my vintage machine is having a bad day and I'm having trouble with tension sometimes I use a sacrificial back you can't do it on a show quilt and Uh I don't really have a great interest in show but then if your tension isn't perfect so I'm just sometimes I'll quilt the top and the batting layer only I do that too I love that I love that and then do you do like pillowcase things so you can put it on once it's done (laughs) so I actually will traditionally bind it because then I'll go and sew, I'll plan my quilting so that then I'll like sew, I definitely want to sew down the rows because you still have to kind of hold those layers together. Right, right, right. Yeah, I love Um, that. I hadn't thought about that way to do it. But I love not having the back all uh, quilted, that it's minimally quilted. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I was really impressed. The quilt, I most of the work I did on this this, uh, pattern that I worked on for my boss, it's... um, I was like, I don't have time. I have to get, it's a signature quilt. So I have to get it done early enough that people have time to sign it. Right, right. <laughs> so I was like, well, I'm just going to go for it. And I have to say my, my vintage machine, the tension was beautiful. Aww. That back looks just as good as the front. That's so great. Um, I love it. It was painful at times to be like, you know, manhandling, which is probably what inspired my husband to say, well, you know, let's look at our finances because you want this thing really badly. Let's see if we can make it happen. <laughs> That's very <Just> nice. <laughs> well, I have to go, but can you, can we chat some more? Cause I just think you're Absolutely. awesome. And I would love to chat Aww. more with you. This has been such a, I can't believe how fast this hour went. Um, but I would well, love I to chat with you. Thank you to you. And I don't know if you've heard this from enough people that I think the conversations you're inspiring are the conversations a lot of people wanted or didn't know they wanted. And I think it's asking really good questions and he, I just love hearing people's perspectives. Yeah, me too. Uh, and it's a way that it hasn't been really, I haven't seen at shows and I haven't seen it at classes. So I'm just so grateful that you were inspired to do this. Well, I, I, it means a lot because it's exhausting. So <laughs> yeah. So I appreciate that. And these conver- I, I love the conversation. At least you were smart you know? enough to wait till after you got tenure. <laughs> That's right, exactly. After I was full professor, right? I was done with That's that. Right. That's right. That's why I didn't go the academic route. I was like, publish or perish? Yeah, that's Yeah, not no, right. not so much. No. I just want <laughs> so to funny. go out and like work on cool stuff. That works for me. <laughs> that's so great. Well, will you sign up again and let's chat some more? Because I think we have more things to talk about. And I just really enjoyed the hour. It was so nice. Oh, it was great to talk with you. And again, thank you so much. No, do you want to review it before I post it? Or are you comfortable with everything? No, if you, I mean, my only, you know, you can cut this part out. Um, if as long, I just want to be respectful that, that our conversation about gender didn't. Oh, I think our gender anyone. conversation was fine. I think we were great. Okay. Yeah, I don't think a, there's a problem yeah. with it at all. And I think it's again, an important like conversation like to an have. Academic a lot, and I just want to, you yeah. know, I know that that. No, so no, no. I think to... it was great. I mean, I really okay. do. I mean, I don't think it's. Un... I think we can talk about these things and be civil and be. I think we have to have these conversations. I think they're good, and I think it was a reasonable conversation. You know. Okay. So, 
And but I'll well, have I'll, you review I'll it. You can on... take a look. Great. Yeah. yeah, I don't have any need to review it. Just have a look at it and think yeah. about it from that. Because sure. I, I don't. I mean, the whole purpose of this is all to be inclusive. So I yeah, just want to make totally. Sure. No, I totally agree. Yeah. I totally agree. Awesome. All right. Well, have a great day. I really appreciate you chatting. You too. Enjoy the rest of your day. All right. Take care. Bye. All right. Bye bye. So you've been listening to Just Want a Quilt, a research podcast coming out of Tulane University Law School. And I'm Elizabeth Townsend Gar. If you like this podcast, keep listening. Also, we have a Facebook group. Come join us. We talk about a lot of things. We also have an Instagram account. And of course, most importantly, I really hope you get a chance to quilt today. 